Council. Uh, my name is Bob Linscheid, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Vice President of the um, Opportunity Task Force, um, joined by uh, Brian Dean, who uh, is involved in education workforce, um, also uh, Elaine Schroth, who handles economic development. Um, my day job, day job is I'm President CEO of the Walnut Creek Chamber, and pleased to be part of this initiative to bring together economic development, educational workforce, and the healthcare industry. Uh, today's session is uh, going to be rather exciting. We're bringing in two excellent speakers, and I want to thank the planning committee uh, for their involvement in putting this all together. With that, the important part of it, uh, we'll have Lindy Lavender uh, lead us through. So Lindy, would you take it away from here? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Bob. Great to have you here. As Bob uh, started us off with, I'd like to just quickly mention our leadership and planning team. Uh, this is actually a pilot project of bringing together multiple task forces under a new umbrella of opportunity. And it's been really successful and we've really enjoyed being able to all work together. So I just wanted to say thank you again to Brian and Jake, who's also a member of our planning and leadership team, Elaine Schroth, who is part of Visit Concord, um, and helped to actually organize this specific meeting and Cindy Hatton who really brings a lot of the health perspective and is the executive director of uh, Hospice of the East Bay. So we've got a really good team that thinks hard about these meetings and comes together to try to bring the most relevant topics to all of you. And that relevant topic today is the state of work, which of course is <laughs> quite important as we're all starting to see vaccinations increase. And I imagine your newspapers as mine are filled up with conversations about when people are going back into the office, how they're going back into the office, what that's going to feel and look like. There's been a lot of announcements lately about hybrid work and some kind of public disagreements about what that'll look like and how we consider equity and needs of employees and employers as we start to think about returning to work um, and the larger implications and impacts of COVID-19. So I think we've got two great speakers here today who are really going to help to inform us about this. We're going to kick off with Adele Beccaro, who is a beloved EBLC board member and executive at Tri Commercial. Um, he's got a lot of great information. I don't want to give anything away, but he prepared some slides for us and some data for us to look at, which I really appreciate. And then Chris Molini is here as well. He's the general manager at Crown Plaza. He's going to talk to us a little bit about what the hospitality, hospitality sector has been seeing and thinking and some of the um, new opportunities and perhaps challenges that are being encountered uh, by those who are in the process of rehiring. So really appreciate, appreciate you being here, Chris and Ed, and we're excited to kick off with both of you. Um, we are going to do a presentation by Ed and then a question and answer and then a presentation by Chris and a question and answer. Um, but hopefully this will be somewhat conversational. So if you do have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat at any time. Or if you'd like to ask that question directly, go ahead and raise your hand. And when we get to the question and answer section, um, we'd be happy to turn it on over to you and or I would be happy to ask your question if it's something you want to just put in chat. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed to give a quick introduction, perhaps of himself and his work. And in the meantime, I will share my screen and get our presentation started. So thank you all so much for being here. I do have a few EVLC announcements that I'll give at the end and some links I'm going to leave in the chat to some upcoming events we have at the East Bay Leadership Council. Thank you, Lindy, and thank you, Bob. Um, I am the, uh, for TRI Commercial, the San Francisco Bay Area Manager, and we were brokerage services and property management services. We have offices on the Creek, Oakland, San Francisco, and um, Silicon Valley. And we also have offices in Roseville, Sacramento. <clears throat> and then in the Bay Area, we have about 40 people, and about 25% of us show up to work um, as of this point. Um, brokerage is a little bit different than um, maybe engineering or some other industries. We actually miss collaboration. We like to exchange information, so I can't wait till everybody comes back um, sooner than later. So what I'm going to talk about is real estate trends in the East Bay. Um, the theme to remember slide, oh, we have slides up. And then the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna, this, this will be the index of what I'm gonna be touching. Remember, real estate is more the after effect than the cause of economic activity. So at the end of the day, real estate is a box and it's economic jobs, economic activity that fills those boxes. Um, yes, housing does cause a multiplier effect and other things, but I'll address that. So I'll give a quick economic real estate snapshot 
population growth. We've had some interesting uh, developments demographically. I'll talk about now in 2225 for projections. Same thing with jobs matching that. I'll then address quickly um, real estate trends in the industrial warehouse retail. Um, each sector is not um, operate is operating differently. What COVID has done is really accelerating um, pre-COVID um, conditions, especially in retail and just in time. Suburban office will be different. I'll talk about that. I'll talk about the state of brick and mortar briefly, retail and restaurants. Restaurants are healthier than we initially thought. I'll go into that. Talk about migration trends of where people are working and moving. And then what are the factors that are going to impact the office market, for instance? So for instance, if I look around the uh, Zoom here, how many people out of 25 are actually in the office? So if you think about it, that's only three people, uh, five people. So the, what that means is remote is still a factor and tenants are still not moving or addressing. I'll go into that. Next slide, please. By the way, if anybody needs a copy of these slides, just email Lindy or me, I'll give my email at the end and I'd be happy to provide these. So the, the prognosis of where we are, the commercial real estate in the Bay Area and East Bay was hit very hard in 2020. Velocity of real estate transactions in some cases per sector was down 70%. So hear that number. Um, we're not talking about single family um, home sales, by the way, which are a little bit different, but the Everybody was staying in place, people weren't moving. So for commercial brokerage companies, we get paid on movement and change. So some of my, uh, some of the peers, our revenues were down 50% in 20, reflecting um, stasis or lack of activity. Um, the stock market, meanwhile, up until the last three days, um, is at all time highs. What, what are they projecting? What does that mean? How will the stimulus impact and the various tax structures? Real estate is really gonna be impacted if half of the tax changes proposed are impacted. And that's already causing some reverberations. And then after the pandemic, whenever that is, um, how are jobs different? Since we are gonna be forever different, um, how, do, how do jobs in real estate reflect that? By the way, again, an interesting stat, 1.5 million Californians are not working. Um, What's causing that? In some cases, their place of work is not there. Some cases they can do their job uh, differently. Um, is there too much stimulus worker benefits or are people still concerned that we don't have enough vaccination percentages out there? But it's impacting. It's amazing the amount of jobs going unfilled right now. So for instance, if you walk up and down the restaurants in Danville or Walnut Creek, some of them are limiting their hours because even if they're paying $20 an hour, they can't get enough workers um, to come to the restaurants. I'm sure the hotels and some of the other industries are suffering the same issue. Um, next slide, please. So my brief predictions ahead of time, um, commercial real estate in the Bay Area and East Bay is actually improving in all sectors with industrial being the hottest. Again, not, I'm not addressing single family subdivision homes, sales which are crazy right now, um, and residential in that form of category. The fourth quarter, um, we actually expect all sectors to be improving with the only laggard really being suburban office. And I'll go into that in a minute. And then the Federal Reserve is now predicting that GMP on a year basis will actually grow at 6.5%. So this year is a recovery year. Um, and how long does it take to get back to pre-COVID? Another year or two, but we're definitely growing again. Next slide, please. Population, there's really two kinds of numbers here. First of all, if you look at the first uh, two numbers, um, the first set, um, you can see that we have 2.8 .8, 2 .8 million people in the East Bay, two counties alone. By the way, in, by some measures, that's the ninth largest metro in the United States. So if the East Bay were a city, it's bigger than Cincinnati, it's bigger than some other cities like that. So we're actually a major metro in our own right. You can also see where the average income is. That's quite high. It's not high enough to buy a house, but it's high relative to the um, averages. So if you went to predictions a year ago, we were going to grow you know, 100,000 people in the next five years, the East Bay income would go up another 10%. But look at the footnote. For the first time, California actually lost jobs this past year. 
in its hundred year last hundred years. Uh, when I looked up some stats just this morning, the Bay Area, except for Contra Costa, lost 45, 46,000 people migrated out of the inner Bay Area to 20. And, and, only, and the only county that actually added net population is Contra Costa, which makes sense because several people have moved out of the you know, inner Bay to the suburbs. And then the other stat that is irrelevant is only 20,000 new residential units were built in 2020. That's part of the reason why people are moving out is because housing is still obscenely expensive. I mean, um, in the 680 corridor, some townhouses and houses are selling at a thousand a foot. Think of that, a thousand a foot. So we have a two bedroom, 1200 feet, 1500 feet, million two, million five. Um, it's, it's more expensive in San Francisco, San Mateo. And that's why people are either moving out to the outer ring, Sacramento or out of the area. Next slide, please. What's the composition of our workforce? First of all, the unemployment went up slightly, 6.7. Um, you always have to look at these numbers and understand how they come up with 6.7. Only if you are out of work and reporting out of work, do you get counted. So if you're actually not working for a year, you're not in the unemployment. So there is what we call a shadow market, a certain number of people who are not just not accounted for. Probably not a surprise to anybody, white collar jobs make up 71% of the employment in the East Bay. That's gonna have significant ramifications for real estate, especially if a percentage of that chooses to stay remote forever. Um, and that impacts all the other sectors. Blue collar jobs are roughly 16% and service workers are roughly, uh, that includes restaurants, retail, hospitality, et cetera. Um, note that our employment situation is better than the state. Southern California and Central Valley have higher unemployment rates. They're at 8.3%. Nationwide, we're around 6.9. Next slide, please. The only thing you have to look at this graph is um, you saw how, if you remember 10 million years ago in, um, let's say, November 19, markets were less than 4% unemployed, um, four and a half, and everything was hunky-dory. And then all of a sudden, March 15th to 20, you can see when official COVID restrictions hit and you see how the uh, unemployment rate jumped above 16%. Um, the East Bay tracked California and the nation and has since settled down. Um, and so it was truly a, a pyramid or a spike, um, but we're still not yet back to pre COVID levels in terms of employment. Next slide, please. So if you look, uh, YLY is year over year percent change. So you can see the East Bay is the lighter green, the darker teal green is California. Um, you can see, except for transportation and warehousing, think Amazon, think Walmart, think just in time, almost every sector had negative job loss. Um, some less than others. Construction makes, makes sense, but you can see leisure and hospitality was hit hard. You can see that um, manufacturing had its share, um, et cetera. Um, with again, transportation. And th that then reflects in real estate where industrial is the most active sector. Next slide, please. Lindy, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, no, back a slide. I was confusing myself. So there's really two stories. The um, apartment rents in San Francisco have actually gone down 25% downtown. So the old stereotype of six uh, software engineers living in a room, um, paying 5,000, 7,000 a month is not happening. Believe it or not, rents in San Mateo and Santa Clara went down 25% over year over year. The East Bay is a little bit more stable, but it's still high. And most landlords are reporting 90, 85, 88 to 90% collection rates on apartment rents. Um, so that's a positive number. There's still a lot of people being hurt still a lot of people who can't afford their rent because they can't get a job. But you can see inexorably that rents have gone up in certain areas. And if you look at the bottom, you can see various cities um, um, where Oakland has some of the higher rents. Um, then if you go to the other side, you can see where some of the lower rents for a typical two bedroom, one bath. Um, anywhere from 2000 to 2900 a month. By the way, if again, if you're a teacher making 62,000 a year, $2,500 a month rent, net of utilities, it's hard to make that work. So again, um, 
this is one reason why we're seeing certain real estate trends occur in the East Bay. Next slide, please. So now we'll go sector by sector. So this is the office sector, which is the weakest sector. So if you look far to the left, you can see the vacancy rate overall, every part of uh, from Livermore to Richmond, from Fremont to um, East County, the um, vacancy rate up to 12. In some areas, it's higher than that. So Shadelands, Walnut Creek could be 18%. Walnut Creek is actually 17% vacant. Oakland is not as bad. Oakland is probably closer to 12. Um, sorry. Um, and then, um, um, but overall um, it's 12%. San Francisco is actually, um, has a higher vacancy rate than this. But let's talk about sublease. So a million feet of sublease has come on in just the East Bay. And that's a lot. San Francisco went from 500,000 feet to 10 million vacant sublease space. Think of that number. So San Francisco used to have some of the highest rents in the country. Now all of a sudden we have 10 million feet. There's been some recent deals, but it is still, the amount of sublease is actually still increasing. That could be a five-year trend where in San Francisco, downtown Manhattan, downtown Seattle, LA, and some other similar cities are facing where the downtown is just not attractive for the next two or three years for various reasons. Um, who benefits and who gets hurt from this? Um, so um, there are a couple of other trends that are going to complicate office space. Um, automation. So banks, insurance companies, engineering companies are accelerating automation of the back office. If you, if you try to call almost any company now, except for some services companies, do you actually ever get a live person? So you're actually talking to whether you call a bank or whatever. So you're going to see more and more jobs, payroll automated therefore disappear, therefore less office space needed. Work from home. We'll get into that in a little more detail, but think of this number. If pre-COVID, 5% of us were working remote. Right now we're averaging 75 to 80%. If that goes down to um, 15 to 25%, that's several, that could be 12 million feet of excess space in the East Bay alone that's not gonna be used. You're not going to see too many new office buildings built, um, except for medical or build a suits or some tech companies. Um, next slide, please. Okay, industrial is the opposite end. If I could hire five industrial brokers, trade three of my office brokers away, that's what I would do um, to reflect where the, the market transactions are going. So the vacancy rate went up slightly um, to overall in the East Bay, but um, we expect that to go back to some markets like San Leandro and Concord are actually 3%. So if you're a, a 10,000 foot user growing to 15,000, you have two choices in Concord. You have one choice in San Leandro. Um, so this market is, is healthy. You can see that year over year, there was positive absorption. Two thirds of that 585,000 feet in the second chart that was absorbed net new space leased is just in time warehousing. Um, logistics, anything related to logistics, anything related to the construction um, residential industry. Um, and so we expect that number to even be better the rest of the year. Average rental rates, again, this is a little bit um, misleading. Um, if you're in San Leandro Hayward, you're actually paying $1.50, $1.70, and this is net of uh, utilities and janitorial. Um, and in Concord, you're paying $1.25. So we're expecting, um, rates to rise for the next um, six months. Um, and and just-in-time delivery, manuf uh, manufacturing assembly will actually be part of that. Um, so rents will rise. Um, next slide, please, Lindy. Almost done. Okay, so this is retail. Several stories here. So again, no surprise, you look on the left side, you see retail vacancies have gone up. We had vacancy issues with retail pre-COVID. Um, if you go to various downtowns in the East Bay, Bay Area, across the country, um, there was probably two and a half feet of retail space for every foot that was needed across the country pre-COVID. So what are we doing with all this retail space? Well, this has dramatic implications. A lot of cities in the East Bay actually rely upon retail space being leased for their general funds. Um, so to the extent that retail is not going to be that driver, it's going to get worse. 
to the extent that we have new concepts for points of origin. So you can actually buy cars from Carvana, shipped from Texas to a warehouse in Hayward, delivered to your door. You have seven days to like it or not. Then if you buy it, there's no store. And who gets the sales tax? Texas or say Landro Warehouse. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of issues like that that change real estate. Average rents, and these are triple net, have actually gone down. Um, so in general, brick and mortar, we have too much space. Everybody knows about Neiman Marcus. Um, what the next round of contraction after, oh, previous slide still. The next round of contraction, everybody knows about Sears, JCPenney, Forever 21, Best Buy, they've all contracted. What do we do with those spaces? Um, if we wait for retail, retail merchandisers to occupy them, in some cases, never, in some cases, five years. So the question is adaptive reuse. What are they utilized for? Are they used for schools? Um, the people who bought Taubman Sun Valley Mall and Taubman Nationwide is Simon Malls. They also bought JCPenney. Um, so Sears and JCPenney are actually real estate plays now. Um, Nordstrom's has announced that they want 40% of their apparel to never see a store. Um, so they're coming out of uh, showcase retail warehouse district stores. So you might go to a, they're closing the one in Pleasanton, for instance. Um, they're tearing down Hilltop Mall to build housing and just in time logistics and minor retail housing. Same thing's going to happen with Somersville Town Center and Antioch. Nordstrom's also, you can look at a typical Nordstrom that has 50 or 40,000 feet. Their new model might have only 20,000 feet. So what do you do with that second floor? Um, and so you can see a lot of department stores actually shrink their footprint. Then we have that excess space. What do we do with it? Um, in some cases, maybe it's torn down for housing. Some cases changed to AI. But zoning is not keeping up with this. A lot of cities have restrictive zoning to their detriment. Some are re-examining that. So for instance, Richmond is all in with rezoning the Hilltop Mall area. Um, Pleasanton's all in with rezoning Ple with down uh, Stone Ridge Mall area, but other areas, um, cities have, have not yet changed the zoning and you'll just have empty boxes. Next slide, please. Okay, the future economy. Who's gonna occupy and what space will be occupied? So workforce changes are, are going to happen. <laughs> um, one of the, um, um, so what jobs will survive? If you're a landlord or a developer of office space, you're gonna be looking at banks and insurance companies shrink their footprint, as I said. We'll need less space for those traditional users. Promote is for here to stay. The question is percentage of how much. And even if it goes down 20%, as I said, that's, that could be 12 million feet excess space in East Bay alone. The Port of Oakland is rebounding and will rebound. Um, both the airport and the port itself. So a lot of uh, import export, Central Valley exports all its crops out of the Oakland airport at uh, Oakland. Um, and then we have just in time delivery. So that will be important. Rail is coming back um, in certain cases. So uh, we're, the East Bay is connected um, east, west and north, south on railroads. So certain developments are looking at that. Tesla, for instance, is looking at a 50 acre rail yard in Lathrop, just outside Tracy. Um, for just-in-time delivery going back and forth to Nevada and up and down the Highway 5 area. Um, Northern Waterfront, I see we have Mike Miguel and others on the call. Um, some of those ports are going to be reactivated. Um, they should look at different strategies than maybe before. Why not advance food processing using some of those ports? We'll eventually see passenger ferry on that, but the Northern Waterfront might return to its traditional maritime uses. Airports. Um, big prediction here. Um, the secondary airports are going to, over time, become very important. One for passenger. So if you can, in Concord is already increasing. Hayward is already increasing. It's passenger, passenger, or short haul jumps. But you're going to see drone activity for delivery out of these airports in five years plus. So drones will be problematic out of San Francisco and Oakland airports. Um, there are now drones that can do 3,000 pound delivery. Think of a container. Um, so you're going to see um, there's seven drone companies experimenting using Byron Airport as we speak. So this will be a major uh, development. And then the um, ecosystem to repair these drones. And my next point, um, that's where new jobs are going to be created. And are we using our schools 
these could be eighty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars jobs. You, you also saw Glideways is signing a contract with California Transit Authority, and they're testing at um, um, on Concord Naval Station, um, Go Momenta. So you're going to see within five years, if not sooner, autonomous delivery, autonomous passenger. Um, when, when people use autonomous vehicles, by the way, you go from an average of 15,000 miles a year to 50,000 miles a year. So again, more maintenance, more jobs. As I mentioned, there's going to be some North Coast ferry service. Healthcare tech is going to be a big winner. Um, whether it's instruments, um, telemedicine, where you're doing it over Zoom. Um, I just had an elective procedure um, and a robot was working on me. Um, with lasers. Um, so again, making those and servicing them. F advanced food processing. Advanced food processing, um, there's already 24 hour concepts that use six people with recycled water and energy. Um, so you can see three story smart buildings that um, outside of our already processing 2,500 tons of Brussels sprouts a month with all recycled uh, materials. That could be in the East County, for instance. The other big winner that I outlined is anything to do with biotech, biosynthetics. So for instance, all the unused diseased wood from the Sierras, that could be pulped. CRISPR technology can rearrange it. Traditional height limit for wood is three to four stories. Oregon and Seattle already have eight story wood structures using CRISPR technology. So think of the jobs that could be created with new synthetic materials for construction. And then biotech is roaring. Buildings are, are setting all time highs in Emeryville and South San Francisco. So the East Bay will benefit from that. Last mile and last hundred yard logistics. That's a big hiring speed. They can't find enough people. They're taking over the warehouse. If cities and counties needed to do something, it's to invest in fiber optics. Those are the new portals. Those are the new um, uh, ports. So in order to do intense data streaming, to send the molecular structure of uh, um, steel or something like that across the line or AI, you need advanced gigabyte uh, fiber optics, not just general um, traditional um, structures. This will be important to invest in. And then renewable energy is going to be a factor um, as we go from um, coal and gas to more solar and other things. Again, where are those gonna be serviced and where are they made? And then one last slide, I think, is that it? That's it. So any questions or um, I can give more details or examples of deals. Um, it mirrors, if you go around the Bay, it mirrors the, a um, lot of our vacancy rates are the same in other cities with San Francisco being the exception. Um, there is a definite migration trend. Um, and again, how does real estate react to that? Any questions? Hey, Ed, it's Kevin, I have a question. Go ahead. Hey, um, you know, with all these, we talk a lot about vacancies and, um, you know, commercial and retail space, but, you know, it's pretty obvious to me where I'm sitting that a lot of these landlords aren't getting paid. What's going to happen when these moratoriums lift for commercial real estate? Do you really think that they're confident enough that they can fill these spaces or kind of what are you hearing? Kind of a broad question, you know? Well, well three short answers. First of all, Counterintuitive, 88 to 90 percent of apartment rents are being collected. Okay, so that's counterintuitive to what you read. Um, a retail is is not as high, but retail rents are being collected here and there. So let's say 50 percent. Office is also 90 percent. Office is getting 90 percent. Industrial is getting 105 um, percent. So therefore. Um, it, the, the landlords that are being hurt the most are the small mom and pops. So if I had three small office buildings, I have a building in Toto Square, a building on Main Street, Pleasanton, and my restaurant's not paying me rent or paying me half rent, I mean, I usually can't pay my mortgage. So we're still going to get fallout from that. Um, and again, the same thing with a strip center. Three of my six tenants aren't paying the rent. So the small landlord is at risk right now. Um, and so in answer to your question, um, there's going to be shakeout and there's going to be, um, um, their sales are occurring as that market gets changed. And now with the threat of capital gains being increased significantly with the possibility of step up basis being eliminated with um, 
and a few uh, 1031 exchange being modified or taken away. Um, if you have a low basis, low debt, you could face high taxes. That's going to cause real estate to change hands. So the next six months for some sectors is gonna to be tough, especially small owners more than not. But office buildings are being sold right now. We've had three major sales in the last 30 days that have set records. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, and what, what kind of price per foot these office buildings are going for? The, you say record, what, give us a okay. kind of an analysis on that. I'll give you a quick map around the base. So downtown Oakland, it's actually healthier than downtown San Francisco, despite without get too much editorial, all the issues that Oakland has. Um, so there's been buildings that have set a record thousand dollars a foot near Lake Merritt. Um, thousand a foot, think of that. Replacement value is around 600 a foot. So that actually that's why um, Heinz just got approved the new 20 story building in Lake Merritt. Um, they just set a um, several hundred dollars a foot in Pleasanton, a building just sold on um, Hop Yard Road. Um, a but a, if you're in Concord, if you're in San Ramon, buildings are selling at two thirds replacement value. So they might be anywhere from 150 to 200 a foot, in some cases 100 a foot. To build a new class A building, 450 a foot, you need $5 rents. The current market's at $2, 225, 350 in the south suburbs. That's why you won't see new um, that. But medical buildings will be built the hospitals are taking over a lot of the um, uh, mom and pop doctors and they require seismic upgrades, fire safety upgrades, so you, and they pay higher rents. Um, and so they're getting 300 to 500 a foot. Industrial is getting 200 to 250 a foot in Hayward San Leandro, Concord 200 a foot. Industrial buildings, tilt ups are selling higher per square foot by 40% in Concord than office buildings. Think of that. Anybody else? Ed, regarding the, the demand for office space in the East Bay, are you finding that um, there's, a, there's a shift towards some work from home as we come out of the pandemic and you're seeing a demand for a smaller office from someone who previously occupied a larger office? Yes and yes. So um, three, three different trends there. Um, right now, 80% of us, the workforce, uh, white collar is working from home. Um, as I said, when that settles down to maybe 20%, 30%, there's going to be a lot of space out there. That's going to drive prices down. The new buzzword is right sizing your portfolio. So instead of 160 or 200 feet a person, it might float down to 120 feet a person, shared spaces, ambassador spaces. So I come into the office for three hours a day, three days a week, um, and I share the space with two other people. Um, so that, that second trend is going to decrease the use of suburban office space. And then third is you're gonna see more and more automation in all sectors. So um, the answer is yes, office space will be reutilized. I mean, I was talking to a, an engineering company um, that had 20 people. So that would be about 6,000 uh, feet, 5,000 feet before COVID. They're gonna to shrink to 1,500 feet, part remote, part share. Hey Ed, this is uh, Alex Evans. Yeah, trying to pull some of this, um, some of these trends together. Great job on the presentation. So when you um, pull some of these together, like you see, seventy-one percent of the East Bay workforce is white collar. You're saying eighty-five percent now work from home, shifting down to twenty percent. Um, is that good news for places like, say, Orinda, Lafayette, Moraga, places that are more residential, even higher concentrations of that? Or the, is what's Bad for San Francisco, kind of good for some of these small towns in the East Bay? Yes and yes and no. Okay, so so here's the no. Well, no, here's the yes. San Francisco, downtown San Francisco and 10 other major metros like Seattle, Portland, Manhattan are going to go through a, what I call a 1980s cycle, if you remember the mid-80s. Um, a lot of people wanted to work downtowns, crime, various reasons. And so there's a migration of population and tenants out of the downtown cores, in this case, west to east. So Walnut Creek, San Ramon, Pleasanton, and Oakland will benefit from that um, in terms of the office. Retail in San Francisco downtown is gonna get hurt because if you take you know, 
20,000 people who no longer shop on market and mission, the retailers get hurt. Um, Cause who's eating lunch, who's buying stuff, you know, next to those empty office buildings. Um, now, if I go back to Lafayette, Danville and those places, um, if 40, if we go to 40% just in time delivery where you order, they're gonna lose the retail tax receipts. That's a different kind of a job that satisfies a takeout order versus cooking. Um, so, so retail receipts for cities will be hurt. If the office buildings don't refill up in downtown Walnut Creek, San Ramon, Pleasanton, and places like that, it will have a definitive effect on adjoining retail. Um, again, um, there's an ecosystem to service those office buildings. So on the other hand, the residential uh, construction is gonna be up because now your townhouse um, has to have an office room. So therefore you're buying stuff. You're retrofitting. So townhouses are going, prices are going up literally in almost every sector of the East Bay. That has cons consequences for construction multipliers. So townhouses in Lafayette are going up. Uh, townhouses in Fremont are going up. Um, and, and so there's some mix and match how it settles out, but it's not for the next three years, it's going to be have some negative effects not using all this office space. Can some of this space, if it's not too old, be retrofitted for hotels? Can some of this space be retrofitted for housing? Can some of this space be retrofitted for other things? That will be a question. I talked too long, Lindy. No, you did wonderful. Thank you for the great questions and uh, from the audience. And Ed, thank you for an awesome presentation. I've already emailed it to three people. So if anyone else would like uh, copies of the slides, I'm happy to send those forward. Um, thanks again, Ed, for being here. And I'm excited to turn it over to Chris. Uh, Chris, do you want to just take it off, introduce yourself a little bit, and then tell us a little bit what you're seeing kind of from the ground floor? Sure. Well, number one, Ed, thank you for the presentation. That was uh, very informative, and I definitely want to get a copy of it. Uh, a lot of moving parts to that, and uh, we, we kind of fit into that into the hotel world. So about me, um, I've grown up in the industry. I'm someone who literally worked my way through high school and college working in the food and beverage industry, paying my rent, paying my bills and all that. And I've been in the hotel business literally all my life. It's what I've done. So I definitely understand all aspects of it. Um, a few little qualifiers when I speak today. So I'm not here representing the Crown Plaza. I'm not here representing any ownership group or any management company or any brand. It's me as a hotelier talking to you guys about a couple of key items that I want to share. Um, but nonetheless, I've grown up in the industry um, and we're in some serious trouble right now from a lot of different aspects. And uh, what, what got me here today was I sit on the board of Visit Concord and was sharing some of my views. And so there's two things I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, California Bill AB84 the rehire bill. And then we're gonna talk about some of the COVID restrictions that are really bogging us down in terms of getting business levels back up. So um, for starters, our industry is really in trouble on a lot of different levels. Um, if you go up to 100,000 feet and look at it, you can see coastal properties, weekend occupancies are very high in the right locations. Um, we're starting to see some midweek occupancy, small amounts of business travel. Um, occupancies are averaging anywhere from 20% up to 50% during the week, depending on where you are. So we're starting to see it come out a little bit, so it's a little better. But nonetheless, um, the low occupancy is compounded with trying to get people back to work, as we had talked about briefly. And I'm happy to highlight some of that and share it with you and what we're trying to do. But uh, so those two factors are what, what we're juggling the most. And then you throw in COVID and the fear factor and all the compliance rules. Um, and it's, it's a pretty uh, difficult minefield to navigate through right now. Um, so, and the other thing that ties into a little bit of about what Ed was talking about, he hinted on it a little bit when we're talking about retail, uh, restaurant, retail type space where getting people to come back to work. And then again, who knows 
what the food and beverage business is going to look like in the hotel industry moving forward. Um, and so I can expand on some of that as well. But for now, I, I, my, my, one of my key motivations to be here was to talk about California, the bill AB 84. And uh, it's basically about rehire requirements for, and I'll talk specifically about the hotel industry. There are other industries that it applies to. Um, but I'm a bit outraged by the bill and I'm a bit frustrated because it is an administrative burden that goes above and beyond. And in my professional opinion, it's another straw on the camel's back in the hotel industry. Um, and in summary, if for those of you who may not be familiar, familiar with it, it's basically dictating uh, seniority type rehire rights to all associates who have worked in the business. I get it. I understand the motivations, but I will say professionally, it's truly not necessary. Um, we're number one, we're having problems getting the associates who we want to come back to work to come back to work. Um, there's a series of factors. You can talk about unemployment and all the monies that are out there now and COVID issues and all those things. But um it's a really big concern because as we begin to see occupancies come back, we're worried about being able to service our guests. Um, and I think a, a big uh, a big factor for us, which I know everyone understands, is we're in the people business. We don't get to work remotely from home, and that's okay. I, I love my business, and I come to work every day, and we come to work, and we service our guests and go through that whole routine. So. AB 84, like I said, I just, I've read through this bill in detail multiple times and it's just a bureaucratic administrative nightmare. And I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it considering everything that's going on. So, you know, I will speak appropriately about it. My goal is someday to get it changed or removed. Uh, it, it had resurfaced. It had come up years ago and, and actually Newsom vetoed it. So why all of a sudden it's gained this traction in this environment that's already so taxed um, is concerning. And, and the bigger picture for all of you is, um, and I'll use my hotel as an example, you know, pre-COVID, I was running a hotel with 17 managers. I'm now running this hotel with seven managers. And so you can imagine the multiple tasking and duties, and then you throw another piece of administrative work on top of that and all the tracking and the requirements. So it's just a, it's just a concern for me. I get it, but I don't. Um, and I wish the bill would go away. So obviously that's not going to happen, but this is a challenge, right? And you look at some of some businesses that are smaller than ours that are required to comply with this. It's a lot of work. At the end of the day, it's a lot of work. And like I said, I won't go through the details of the bill, but it's very concerning. So I wanted to share that with you today. Um, we have a great hotel, great workforce. We love each other, all that kind of stuff. Work well, and people want to come back to work. So we're trying, but I was just shocked when I saw the detail of the, the bill and the requirements. Um, the other piece I want to talk about today is when we talk about COVID and we talk about the health requirements from the health codes and the counties and the state and the federal and all that, this is another very, very difficult hurdle for us to get over. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little bit of paraphrasing to bring it down to the level of a client booking business. So amidst the social distancing, amidst the mask requirements and all the safety food touch requirements and all that, it's become very, very complex. And we are, we are reinventing ourselves, we're re-engineering how we do those things, but then you take a more complex piece is the, what I call the COVID policing uh, aspect. And I do need to apologize to everybody. Elaine will vouch for me. I'm pretty direct and not always the most politically correct, but I'll tell you what's on my mind. And at the end of the day, I'm a pretty good person always trying to make better, but this, this thing is a nightmare. And so what's happened in summary is um, through all of the requirements, and legal people looking at it and contractual written obligations, we now have these clauses in our contracts that basically say, you, the event host, are now responsible to validate 
either vaccination or COVID testing for all of your attendees every time you do an event. Um, so put yourself in that event planner's shoes and it's complicated enough to have a group type event or an event and get things come off. Now this piece has been added. And so the short story reaction is people are saying, well, I'm just not having my event. I'm not gonna do that. There's no way. It's not realistic for me to manage through that type of process. It's enough to just get the event done and make it successful. And I'm saying that with the temperament of, I assure you, I understand all the complexities of COVID and everything that's going on. And from a health and safety perspective, um, we, we do well at that and we comply with it, but it's just another barrier for us to getting our business up and running. And when we talk about what Ed talks about in terms of business development and hotels coming back to life, I think it's going to be a very different industry in the next five years, and especially from the food and beverage perspective. And that takes me to my concern. If we're all re requir required to change our food and beverage environments too much, and they begin to naturally downsize because of their viability, it just means less work for less people, for more people, right? It, it's, it's counterintuitive. So, you know, those are some, some very serious concerns we have, and, and we're working to be creative. I mean, I, I, I want to say I heard Ed mention some of the pay rates for, like, the restaurant retail. Obviously, we look at all of that. And then on top of the things that Ed's talking about, you look at labor costs and inflation and what's coming against the pay rates, because at the end of the day, if we take up our pay rates, we have to charge more for our rooms and our food and beverage and all that. And, and everybody understands all that. So, you know, in, in just wrapping up, I love this business, but these are a couple of things that have popped up in my life recently. And while I understand them, I'm someone who as a true hotelier is looking for relief from these kind of things. I need less bureaucratic administrative requirements. Uh, you'll find in general that if you go up to 100,000 feet and look at the hotel industry, it's pretty good at self-regulating itself and following rules and guidelines. And, and we've done very well with all that. So those are a couple of big challenges we're having. Um, our occupancies, and I, if I just talk in general, our occupancies are not rebounding as quickly as we would have hoped across the industry. So we, we hang on to that and obviously we're trying to adjust and come back, but uh, it also counter ties back into some of Ed's discussions when you talk about, we'll call it commercial real estate, and you talk about big hotels. Uh, I can't imagine with some of these big box urban hotels and that there's no convention business going on right now and so on and so forth, what the ripple effects will be down the road. And at the end of the day, my job is to generate revenue, drive occupancy, and have lots of people that work with me every day. And so we're, we're really up against the wall right now. So just a quick summary of everything. I hope it's okay. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions that anybody would like to ask. Thanks, Chris. If you wouldn't mind putting that bill number in the chat just so that people have it, and I'd be happy to link to them some information. Okay, um, great. Yeah, that, happy was, to uh, do. that was my question was, is AB 84, correct? Yes. Yeah, I was reading the I was reading the text on it, and it's really, really, really confusing. Um, you know, so it's essentially making what hospitality uh, companies have to uh, decide on who they can and cannot hire based on their seniority. Yeah, if you were if you worked in the business in 2019 and you had a higher date whether it was that year or 10 years before, long story short, you're supposed to call back folks in order of their seniority date, which union or non-union at the end of the day, that's naturally what's probably going to happen anyways, just because the workforce is so restricted. Yeah. But then, then if you were to go further into the bill, it's all the tracking and the timeline. And this, yeah. this bill carries out through uh, December of 2024 and you've still got to track and manage all this paperwork. And to be honest, for what? 
because I, I I don't know who who in their right mind is going to come and audit that. It'll 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 take them years just to go through what they're trying to require you to comply with, and it's just like I said, I I don't think it's it's necessary, but nonetheless, it is an administrative burden, and uh, yeah, it's it's re it's something we would naturally do anyways, and I understand politics and all that, but I I was just really shocked when I started reading into the obligations that the bill has imposed on us. And, and it's an industry, obviously, that's literally down on the ground right now. And this is one of the last things we needed was to throw this on top of us. Yeah, I appreciate you um, answering. It was very curious to me because I'd grown up in the hospitality business too as well, um, serving tables. And so it's, it's really, and and so now in Martinez dealing with businesses, small businesses, that anything else you can layer on top of it to make their lives miserable is 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 pretty astounding. Um, so I appreciate you bringing it to um, our, our my attention um, in, in particular. And, uh, so this is, you know, this is an example of uh, a bill. In fact, in Santa Clara County, um, the Board of Supervisors of the city of San Jose were trying to enact similar uh, types of legislation on a local level. And I believe it was the uh, district attorney's office said they they couldn't uh, they couldn't regulate. So you can you can situate this bill all you want, but the district attorney's not going to provide resources to pursue what they consider to be probably really flibberous flibberous uh, uh, issues like this. So uh, I'm I'm with you on that. Uh, I appreciate Lindy you putting that in the uh, in the box. Yeah, and Bob, He's that's an excellent you, point, too, because uh, the, the other thing that concerns me is, you know, I, you, what I understand, is supposedly the, as I understand the necessities of government and all that, but I'm really more and more concerned about what I'll call the overreach of government into the private sector, and when they start dictating all of these types of rules, I, I mean, it's just absurd. It, it is, and I, and I respect government. I understand the need for certain things, but this this bill definitely tipped over things for me when I saw this. Huge unintended consequences, right? Yep. So, Chris, what agency has oversight? Labor Department? Uh, you know, I'm not sure yet. I have to read through <laughs> all that, but it is probably the Labor Department, if I rem remember correctly, within the bill. They'll be the ones who will be responsible to enforce compliance if issues come to come to bear. And does your uh, business association have statewide uh, have any ability to go in and challenge it? Sounds to me like there might be constitutional issues. You know, David, that's an excellent point, and yes, I believe so. So where, where my expectation will come as a hotelier is from the California, you know, Hotel and Lodging Association, oh. because we contribute to political campaigns or, you know, legal and all that. So, yeah, I, and I'm surprised, to be honest, that there isn't some somebody of substance and power that's going to step up and challenge the constitutionality of this, purely because of its dictations to the private sector, which go beyond anything I've ever seen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. And if anyone has any further questions for Chris, I'm happy to connect to the both of you um, or feel free to put them in the chat that we do have just a few more minutes. And I wanted to wrap up by just thanking Chris and Ed for being here. And again, thanking the Opportunity Task Force leadership team for helping to plan this meeting. Elaine Troth um, was hugely instrumental in helping us put this together. So thank you, Elaine. And thank all of you who've joined us. We've got a really robust group, which is always exciting to see because it means that EVLC is, is coming up with topics and things that are really interesting to many different members, and I really always appreciate seeing that. So I did just want to make one final announcement, which is that East Bay Leadership Council has an event um, next week on May 19th with Senator Steve Glazier. And if you're interested in attending, uh, I'll put the link to that in our chat. But it's free to members, and it's an opportunity to come talk to him about some of his thoughts, his legislative priorities, the budget surplus that we're seeing talked about a lot this week. Um, and specifically, we're going to be concentrating on housing and transportation issues and his thoughts on infrastructure as we move forward. But it's certainly an opportunity to talk to him about um, other issues and subject matters as well. So that was my announcement. Many of you did reach out to me about slides. Most of you should have them already. I was sending emails as I was listening to Chris. But if not, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, 
So anything you wanted to say as we conclude, Bob? I just want to thank the panelists in particular for their uh, presentation today. And as, as we look at un uniting business throughout the region, uh, it's always helpful to have good data and uh, rely on, on our, our speakers for that kind of thing. So really appreciate it. And thank everybody for attending today. Thank you.